I'd like to call the Board of Selection meeting to order for Tuesday evening, September 1st, 2020, uh, and read the following statement. This meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access. Pursuant to an order issued by the Governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the Town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. May I please ask at this time that if there is anyone who is recording the meeting, if you could please identify yourself by either using the raised hand function uh, or uh, the lines are, uh, you will be offered the chance to unmute your phone, which time you can identify yourself. Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, first item of business on the agenda is the approval of the minutes dated July 28th, 2020. Um, I know, uh, Heidi, thank you for uh, circulating those minutes. Uh, I'm ready to move ahead on those. Joe and Bill, uh, if, if you are as well, we can. I, I am, and I move to approve the minutes dated July 28, 2020. Second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary, aye. Um, on our agenda this evening, um, prior to a few business items, we do have some possible votes and I know that we're joined by several guests this evening. So uh, Tom and Michelle, if it's agreeable to you, I would actually like to go to the four possible votes before we do the COVID-19 update and the appointments. Okay, Absolutely. Yep. nodding and- Sure. Excellent, okay. So uh, we're going to start with the traffic calming plan associated with the redevelopment of 6th Station Street. I see that many of the parties who were on last week are here. Um, I also would just note for the record that the board did receive uh, some feedback from a citizen. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Dirk and others uh, responding to it. And my understanding is that that has led to uh, a minor modification or two in the plan. Uh, I'm just looking, I, I think I see uh, Mary Savage Dunham is on the line. So uh, Mary, I think I might turn this over to you and leave it to your discretion as to who to bring into this conversation uh, so that the board can take a vote. Actually, Mayor Carey, before we begin, I'm gonna um, recuse myself. I'm gonna butter to Sixth Station Street. And Heidi, I'd ask you to note that in the minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for the reminder. Mary? Thank you, Mary. Um, so just very briefly, that was a perfect introduction. We did discuss this when last you met. We're talking about traffic calming being proposed by the applicant, Matt Falconeri, for Station Street and North Street, and it's to satisfy a condition of the site plan review decision. And so you heard last time the traffic calming plan, and then Mr. Dirk was on the line, and he presented his comments in the form of a letter dated August 5th to you. Um, he opined on the original presentation and suggested some minor modifications. When you continued the matter, the applicant, Matt Falconeri and his traffic engineer, who I'm gonna turn this over to very quickly, Steve Finland, went ahead and he modified that traffic calming plan to the revised exhibit that we received yesterday and then we received a further revised um, exhibit today with um, the proper um, text box and labels on the plan. And this revised plan that's in front of you right now incorporates all of the conditions and modifications that came out of Jeff Dirk's review. And it also shows a minor change to the curb line in front of Sixth Station Street. And that is in reaction to questions about the sight line distance looking east from Station Street that you receive from a customer, uh, uh, a citizen. And so um, with that, and I will tell you, before I turn it over to Steve, we did discuss the site distances at length during the um, 
hearing process, we didn't, the planning board did not ultimately place any conditions with regard to the site distance looking east. Um, that being said, Mr. Dirk in his review of the revised plan did indicate in his comments that modifi modifying that curb line did address the citizen concerns about the sight line. So I think that that's good news and good news. And um, if I may, I'd like to just toss it to Matt and Steve to explain your proposal as revised. Sure. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Steve, do you want to take the floor? So thank you, Mary. Uh, for the record, my name is Stephen Finland. I'm a senior project manager with McMahon Associates. Uh, we were brought in to uh, develop this traffic calming plan that's being discussed. Um, in, at the last hearing, uh, last meeting, I should say, I, I went through the, uh, the plan itself um, for the board to see, and as well as the public that was on the call. Was on the uh, call. Also went over through the comments that Mr. Dirk, the peer reviewer, had at that time. So we went through those comments. And since that time, we've updated the plan to reflect those comments. Um, I believe we went through each of those comments in detail last time. Um, so I have the plan. If you want me to share the plan, Mary, or let me see if I can. Please do. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Just kind and maybe of... you can talk about the site distances. We can see it. Can you see the plan? Yes. Yes. Great. So thank you. Um, so as you can see here, the major things that we changed on our plan that were that were uh, that came out of Mr. Dirk's peer review was uh, number one. There was originally proposed signs on North Street for pedestrian crossings. Um, we, in lieu of those signs, we agreed. The applicant, I should say, agreed to provide two uh, speed limit si speed uh, radar signs. Um, that are noted now in the note box down here under number two. So those, that equipment will be provided to the police department for installation or uh, temporary installations at locations that um, will be determined in the future. Um, the second thing had to do with the um, Station Street approach to North Street. I did talk to Mr. Dirk earlier this week as well to confirm what he was looking for. So as you can see here, we're providing a painted island on the Station Street approach. Um, we also ran a turning movement vehicle for vehicles coming down North Street that are going to be taking this right that really dictated what the, the pavement markings would look like here. So that is now proposed um, as a uh, pavement marking here. So that was the second comment that was raised. The third comment had to do with the parking space down here on, uh, on North Street. I think it was discussed at the meeting uh, last time and also in the letter to remove that space. So this note here uh, re, uh, calls out to remove that parking space to improve sight distance for vehicles that are stopped here at the stop line that want to turn left or right. Um, and I believe the last comment that Mr. Dirk had was related to the crosswalks. Originally we showed these, I believe, as black uh, crosswalks with white borders. So we've updated those crosswalks to match the crosswalks that are currently um, shown on the North Street Station Street intersection. So that's what you see here called out with the red border, uh, the red with the, the white border. Uh, so those were the four comments that were raised by Mr. Dirk in uh, the peer review of this letter. Um, there was no additional comments uh, related to site distance in his letter. So um, this is the first I'm hearing about a site distance issue. So the four issues that were raised um, have been um, included on this plan for you to vote on tonight. So I'm here to answer any questions that the board may have as well as Matt as well. Thank you. Um, Mary, uh, do you, um, should we address that, that one last point or do you? Yes, would you sure. I'm happy. I'm happy to jump in Mary if you'd like me to. Thank you. Okay. So. What we're talking about with another comment with regard to site distance is uh, the Board of Selectmen received public comment from a resident who was um, speaking to the site distance looking east from Station Street and um, commenting that he felt that it could use some improvement or should be reviewed. Um, he frequents that intersection and is very familiar with it. Um, 
I forwarded that comment to Mr. Dirk and Mr. Falconeri to look at. And when we received the revised plan from Mr. Finland, I forwarded that to Mr. Dirk as well. Mr. Dirk responded to me on uh, Monday and he said that he reviewed the current version of the traffic calming plan, which reflects all of the recommendations from the August 5th letter. In reviewing the draft plan, I note that the curb line along North Street is being modified in front of Sixth Station Street, which should address the site distance issue to the east that was raised in the resident comment letter. As such, I would suggest that the site distance issue that was raised be reviewed by DPW and the police after occupancy, as the sight line to the east does not cross the parking space in front of Sixth Station Street. So um, I was just reading to you from Mr. Dirk's review comments on the revised plan. And so what he's saying is with the modified curb line, there's not a sight distance issue between that parking space and the sight distance looking to the east. Um, he does suggest that once ever, all the improvements are done, that certainly we have DPW and the police on site to take a look at it. As you know, the police and the selectmen have the authority to take action if an issue is identified. Um, so did I explain that thoroughly, Mary? I have so before turning it to my colleagues for questions, um, Steve, I didn't know if, if you wanted, if you were on that line to make any comment on that. Lost you there, Mary, for a minute. I beg your pardon. Um, I wonder if um, uh, Steve or not want to make any comment before trouble. trouble. Mary, you're real scratchy. It's hard to hear you. Oh, looks like we may have lost you all together. So we can, um, is she, can she, is, is she still on the call? Yeah, Mary, you're on the call. Or maybe she's not. I think she's probably going to try to dial in. Okay, so we can. We need her for a vote, so we want to. Exactly. Matt. Well, we wait yeah. for Mary. Could you um, tell the board the status of your project and when do you think you'll be asking for an occupancy? Sure. Um, so we have a, the mixed use building. We have one retail unit and four residential units. The, um, the retail unit, we're anticipating um, beginning the process with the building department just after Labor Day for obtaining sign offs. Um, we already have scheduled, you know, the, the various inspections with, with fire and plumbing and electrical and all that. So, so that's for the retail. And then um, two of the residential units, um, we will be seeking occupancy permits um, in the beginning to middle of October. So roughly five to six weeks away on, on the residential. Um, the, the, landscaping you know the brick sidewalks are all complete so over the next two weeks we'll be doing the um the plantings and stabilization of the yards um, that's pretty much where we're at great and when mary comes back i'm back she's back <laughs> yay um if i may i was just going to ask mr falconeri to um speak to his timeline for proceeding with these improvements if they're authorized. Um, those would, I would have assume to... you'd coordinate with Randy. Pardon? You, I presume you'd coordinate with Randy. Correct. Yeah. So um, pending, pending his approval or anyone else's sign offs, um, we would get these implemented ASAP. You know, the signs take a little bit to, to make. Um, so upon their completion, we would, we would seek to get them installed. Okay. Um, 
thank you very much. I apologize. We've been having uh, internet connection difficulty in our home for the last two hours. Um, at this point, um, I think I'd like to just uh, open it up to my colleagues uh, for any questions or comments that they have. And actually, since Bill is recusing, uh, Joe, any, any additional questions or comments with respect to the plan that's before us tonight? I, I mean, I think it's really a considered plan. I just want to make sure that I understand the response to the uh, question that came up uh, that was presented to us, the concern, uh, which is when you approach North Street from Station Street and you want to make a right-hand turn, um, the comment was, uh, since, you, uh, let me just read it. Uh, uh, let's see, having been on Station Street at the stop line facing North Street, you do have to drive beyond the crosswalk to see oncoming traffic from the right side, which I believe, Mary, is the east side because the corner of the building does give the operator an obstructed view. One cannot see to the right far enough without driving beyond the crosswalk. So that was the specific concern. And then the response that came from Jeff Dirk said, quote, I agree with the resident. And I know that we have discussed removing the, uh, the first space in front of Six Station Street or designated short-term drop-off pickup, but don't see this in my review letters. Um, and then I guess I didn't understand how addressing the curb um, would solve the problem since the problem, as I understood it, related to the building, the building itself, which was creating an obstructed view. Um, so can you just help me to understand how what's being considered would address this concern about when you wanna make a, to look for the traffic coming from the right-hand side? which I guess is to the east. I, I can, ch I can chime you. in. Okay. Um, so basically, Joe, the, the, the granite curbing radius sends you further west, therefore distancing you from the building. Okay. okay. Which would improve your sight line around that corner. Does that make um, sense? So in other words, as, as someone pulls up to make that turn they'll be further towards the center line of the road that's correct um yeah the center line of the road got repainted so those lines moved west towards one station street the brick apartment building yep um that being said further distancing you from our new building right right which in turn provides greater sight distance looking to the right looking to the east yep okay no, that, I follow it. That makes sense. Okay. Um, have the police, uh, has anyone from the police department uh, looked at this concern and are they satisfied that we can proceed? If Joe, I, I spoke with uh, Sergeant Jeff Kilroy and he was uh, involved in the initial meeting and he said he's fine with the proposed changes. Great. Okay. Thanks. I have no further questions. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to open it up to questions uh, from the public for uh, relative to items uh, for this agenda item. And uh, Michelle is going to be sort of my eyes and ears and uh, let me know if, if anyone does have a question or wishes to make a comment, could you please use the raised hand function? And uh, while we're waiting, Heidi, perhaps if you can offer to unmute the lines so if anyone calling in has a question or would like to make a comment, they would also have an opportunity. So we'll just pause for a moment. I see a few open lines, Mary, but no raised hands at the moment. Okay, all right. Um, Thank you. Well, uh, I think at this point, um, uh, I think my Hello. questions. Hello? Hello? Hello. Is there someone who uh, wishes to make a comment on this agenda item? Uh, yes, Bob Fournier, 1804 okay. Hockley Drive. Welcome, Bob. Uh, uh, please, uh, your question or comment? Uh, well, my question is that um, if you're trying to make a left turn 
onto North Street from Station Street. Um, I know that that other than moving the crosswalk, which probably uh, can't happen, you still have to get out quite a ways. But the main problem is the, the, the speed coming down from the east to the west on North Street. There's no uh, traffic signs there, not even a recommended speed sign at that point on North Street. And because of the speed coming out of that intersection to make a left turn onto North Street from Station Street does pose a problem as far as seeing the cars far enough to make the turn safely without getting run into. So I guess I guess my my solution would be to I guess you have to go to the state to have them approve a, a reduced speed limit in that area of um, North Street through town. But that would be my recommendation, just okay. to be on the safe side of the the view going uh, to the right, looking towards um, the east on North Street to see the cars coming at you because they're, they're doing a pretty good clip through there. I wouldn't say they're going over the speed limit, but they are doing at least 30 or 40 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. And that would be one of the real solutions would be to slow the traffic down. Um, I know radar signs are, are great, and they, they do have a smiley face if you go under 30, uh, at least the ones in Weymouth do. But uh, I think they need something more substantial as far as a, a legitimate speed. Those yellow and black speed signs are recommended speeds, and, and uh, they really can't be enforced. It's just a recommendation. So that's my only comment. Th- if, thank you. If, if I thank can you. follow um, up. On, yes, on, please. On, I want to follow up with uh, Chief Jones on that. Um, first, is is that a state road that the state would need to adjust the speed or is, does the Hingham, town of Hingham have control? And second, um, do you have any uh, records in terms of like traffic accidents at the intersection of North and uh, Station Street just by way of background if it's currently creating a problem? Yeah, we can easily get that uh, information, but that's not one of the um, high accident locations in town. Uh, as far as that road being a, a state road, it is not. It's uh, maintained in the town of Hingham. Uh, but to apply for a, um, a different speed limit than what the state uh, mandates, we do have to apply to the state and have uh, there's a series of um, things we have to undertake, such as a speed study, et cetera, to adjust a, uh, a speed limit. Okay. Okay. Um... Joe, how um, how would you like to proceed on this matter? It sounds like the <clears throat> excuse me potential outstanding issue is one that uh, that while important is somewhat out of the scope of the traffic calming plan that's that's for consideration before us tonight. Um, I would be prepared to move forward tonight if you are, um, I- but I would I would want to. Um, potentially follow up because um, uh, I was actually at that same intersection on Saturday morning and turning left onto North Street and um, I had a similar observation to Mr. Fournier. Yes, so uh, I'm prepared to proceed and I think we should proceed. Uh, I am wondering, and this is really a question to the applicant, uh, to what extent that we can provide for uh, a look back period, whether it's six months or what the appropriate time period would be. And if, and if we get, you know, reports, if the police receive reports that there are problems uh, that we can be asking the applicant to do, you know, some additional traffic, traffic calming measures to attempt to address it. Is that something that uh, would be acceptable? Um. In regards to the speed limit on North Street? Well, I don't think you can adjust the speed limit, but if, there, right. if there's anything else, um, and it may be there's nothing further that the applicant can do, uh, but at least uh, to, um, to understand that we would want to come back and look at how this, is, uh, how this intersection is, uh, is working out after the 
current proposals, uh, the traffic calming plan is implemented to see whether or not anything further should be done. Uh, what, what, one, I, one quick idea, if you don't mind, if I jump in, Mary. Sure. Um, one, one idea, Joe, might be to refer the, the speed limit question to the traffic committee. That's a great idea. Uh, also, um, I don't know, Mary, if you, or Mary Savage Dunham, if you have any uh, additional thoughts. Um, I just wanted to echo the comments that Mr. Fournier made. We have discussed um, with Sergeant Kilroy and Jeff Dirk, Randy Sylvester, former chief, um, and the Downtown Harbor Visioning Study, as well as the group of residents that are looking at creating a cultural district downtown and the Downtown Association, the concept of whether a reduced speed district might be appropriate as Hingham works to continue to revitalize the downtown and connect the harbor and downtown. And in all of those discussions, there's been an acknowledgement that there's a lot of pieces of the conversation advancing. And that was part of why you saw Jeff Dirk recommend that the radar speed indicator lights not be installed with this project, but that the equipment be provided to the police department because it may ultimately be determined that there's a more appropriate location for the signs, maybe at the start of the district, right? right? So I just wanted to share with everyone that this is an ongoing conversation. I think there's many different parties engaged and it would be good to get them all together talking about it cohesively. Um, so I just, it's under advisement and we should keep talking about it. But Mary, is, is there anything further you think that this applicant can or should do to address the issue that's being discussed? I don't, I, I my traffic engineering degree is expired, but uh, in my opinion, the applicant has done above and beyond what he's been asked to do. And he's participated um, and everything that Mr. Dirk asked him to do, he agreed to. So I feel that he can't control the speed limits on you know a larger area than this project yep so it's, i think it's you know, just picking up on what tom said it's it, it's going to be up to uh either the planning board or the board of selectmen to follow up uh with the traffic committee to see uh, what further steps the town should be taking to address this potential safety issue mm -hmm. yep I I like the idea of referring it to the traffic committee, uh, Joe, if, if you're comfortable with that as well. Yes. Okay. Um, so with that being said, I, uh, I, I think uh, I'd be, uh, Joe, I'd accept a motion. Oh, uh, yeah, I'd accept a motion. So I move to approve the traffic calming plan dated September 1, 2020, prepared by McMahon Associates for improvement to Station Street and North Street and to authorize the implementation of such work by Falcon Air Construction, subject to coordination with and applicable conditions imposed by the Hingham Department of Public Works for work in a public right of way. Second, any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Mary? Aye. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Falconeri. Uh, Steve, thank you uh, for your great work. Um, this is really, it's exciting to see that site being developed and uh, saw the signs for cloth in the window. So uh, th this is really exciting to see happening. And, and as I said last week, it really is a beautiful building. And um, I appreciate that you've gone, as, as Mary Savage Dunham has said, above and beyond the call of duty to address traffic concerns. Um, Matt, you consistently listen to the voices of Hingham residents and boards and work with us in a cooperative fashion, and it, it really is a pleasure to work with you. So we, we wish you and your team best of luck as you conclude the project. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, next item of business on the agenda is uh, we have an agreement with, uh, to sign with Comtrack for a fiber optic municipal area network project. Uh, I believe our director of IT, Steve Becker, is on the line. Uh, Tom and Michelle, is, is this something one of you would like to introduce or would you prefer Steve do that? Sure, I can introduce it and then turn it over to him if you don't mind. Thank you. 
So the um, Comcast notified us a little while ago, uh, some time ago, that they were going to be discontinuing um, what's referred to as their iNet. And that is a, a fiber-like line that, uh, that the town uses for all of our um, high-speed internet usage um, across the entirety of the town, uh, the town government. And we necessarily need to replace that if they're going to be removing it. So uh, that prompted an article that was uh, brought up at this past town meeting and actually held in June, I almost said April, um, where we uh, requested and received $500,000 for the build out of a town owned fiber, uh, fiber loop. Um, Steve will, uh, I think now can explain, and I think we have the vendor on the line as well, can explain um, the nature of the project, uh, what it will entail and how it will help the town. I uh, hopefully, uh, this is Steve, hopefully everybody can hear me. Ken. I'm getting feedback. Is, is everyone else or is it just me who's hearing sort of? Maybe if everyone echo. can mute. Yeah, I can hear a little bit of an echo from everybody, but. Yeah. So uh, the fiber project uh, is part of the Comcast com, uh, contract, uh, which originated, I believe in 1999. Uh, they built out an INET, uh, which connected all our municipal buildings uh, with fiber. Uh, that allows us to um, provide data, telephone uh, connectivity between all the buildings. Uh, without this uh, fiber in place, we would be able to communicate, the schools wouldn't be able to communicate together. Uh, our phone system wouldn't work. Uh, outside buildings such as DPW, fire stations, wouldn't have access to our files, email, uh, internet access, things like that. So it's pretty much everything uh, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, part of the new contract that was signed in August of uh, 2020, uh, I'm sorry, 2019, uh, Comcast is gonna discontinue that INET uh, and they have given us uh, a two year period ending in August of 21 uh, to replace that fiber. Um, so we have contacted uh, Comtract who is on the uh, state contract uh, for doing this type of uh, fiber replacement, uh, fiber installation. Um, and they have proposed a uh, a loop. So currently, right now, we have what they call a star topology, uh, where all the remote buildings come into the town hall. Um, and that provides connectivity, but doesn't provide any redundancy in the event that uh, a telephone pole is, you know, taken, taken down uh, at the end of, say, Central and Main Street. Um, and the way that the network is set up, it's not... It's not specifically a, a star topology. It's anything from that point on to the south end of town uh, would be taken offline, uh, which as you can imagine would, <laughs> wouldn't be good, especially for me. That would make for a bad day. Um, so the new fiber would uh, create a redundant loop uh, so that in the event of a, um, you know, a pole being taken down by an accident or a storm, uh, that would provide an, an alt alternate path for the data uh, to, get, to get back to where it needs to go. Um, it also would add in several locations that we don't have on, uh, that we don't have connected now. Um, uh, Harbormaster Intermodal Building uh, would be brought uh, on the fiber. Right now it's connected via um, uh, wireless point to point, which uh, is not very reliable during storms. Uh, the other locations would be GAR Hall and um, um, the transfer station. And it would also uh, go by uh, the, the proposed location for the new public safety building. Um, so it's, it's really critical that um, our fiber is replaced, uh, that we continue without any uh, disruption to that network. Um, as I said, because 
everything we do, all the departments, uh, all the phone communications uh, go through that, um, uh, that connectivity. Uh, Brian, uh, uh, Brian Hopkins uh, from Contract is on the line. I'm not sure if he has anything else to add. So I just tried to unmute the three phone lines. I think Brian's one of them. Uh, that should be me. This is Brian Hopkins <laughs> from Comtrack. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, in relation to what you're talking about, you pretty well described it. Uh, we've been, just a little bit of history here with Hingham, we've been working with Hingham since uh, 014 on some expansion projects. And I actually go all the way back to the 2008 negotiation with Comcast with your attorneys and working on that years and years ago. So this network is what's called a fiber optic municipal area network. It's a private network. It's owned by the town of Hingham. It is, as Steve indicated, a redundant topology that provides you the backup, if you will, for any failures in fiber at any point in time. We've designed this. Uh, it's gone to bid with Hingham. It's been approved at this point to this level. And I'm on the phone tonight essentially to answer any questions that may come up with regards to the network or the deployment or anything of that nature. Thank you. Uh, Joe or Bill, any questions about, uh, about this project? Uh, Joe? Uh, I, actually, my first question is for Tom. Um, because I note that part of this project uh, is dealing with the schools. Uh, there's, it looks like there's a, a network, uh, you know, except connecting the high school, the middle school, the three elementary schools, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, South, Foster, Plymouth, and East, as well as the school maintenance building and the school gatehouse um, on Fort Hill Road. And my question is, um, from a budget standpoint, is it, does any of this affect the school budget? No. no. Um, and should it be affecting the school budget? Uh, nope. The, um, the entirety of the cost of the project is borne by the, uh, by the article, uh, the, the, the funds awarded in the article, the $500,000 with the um, addition of a $60,000 um, uh, negotiated payout from Comcast for the for transfer uh, transition purposes. Okay. Um, next question is, uh, while this work is being done, would there be any disruption of town services or town activities? Uh, I can probably answer that. Uh, it will be uh, basically installed in parallel with what we have now. Uh, once it's finished, there might be a, you know, a slight disruption while we switch over uh, from the Comcast INET uh, to the new uh, fiber, but uh, that should be minimal. Great. Um, and I got one more question. It concerns uh, the warranty that goes along with this. It, it, I, I'm not sure I understood how that works. Are, are we getting a warranty through Corning cable systems, or is this a contract warranty? I can answer that for you. The warranty itself actually comes from Corning cable systems. Comtract is what Corning would call a certified extended warranty provider. So if there's any issue with the cable itself, the workmanship, the connectors, or anything else that's involved in the network, including splicing, contract would fix, fix that and then we essentially bill Corning for any repairs that would be warranty related on the network. So you wouldn't you would not anticipate the town having to bear any work and any of the bills associated with warranty work? No, you won't even see them if you do have warranty work. And are there disruptions or problems that could arise that would not be covered by the warranty? Yes, there are. If you have a hurricane, tree damage, or something along those lines, that's not covered by warranty. Um, and, 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 and Joe, that would, that would be covered under our umbrella policy um, with the town. Okay, uh, to all the questions I have, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill, questions on this? 
Yeah, just two quick questions. Um, Steve, during the installation phase, uh, will there be any negative impacts on the communication ability of our dispatch center for our public safety apparatus? Uh, Bill, no. Uh, they're on a whole separate uh, network than we are, uh, so they won't be affected. Okay, thank you. And, and my second question is, one, um, obviously technology changes all the time, but once we do this, um, this upgrade, um, how long will this last, do you think, before we will need to do another one? Assuming it'll be a couple of years. I can, yeah, I can address that as well. The warranty period that we just talked about is 25 years. The lifespan on fiber is upwards of 40 plus years under general conditions. So you've got a long way to go. From a, from a technology standpoint, Bill, uh, Steve, can you, um, can you speak briefly to the, um, to the upgrade that was, that is being proposed and being implemented? Sure, the, especially if you're worried about uh, long-term uh, viability of it. Uh, basically, it's uh, upgrading the hardware at the endpoints uh, to increase speeds uh, and uh, basically adjust with, you know, increasing technology needs in the future. You just adjust the hardware on the, at the endpoints and the fiber uh, will be able to accommodate that speed increase if i can just follow up on bill's question are there capacity issues that uh you know three or five years from now we may be bumping up against i don't think so i, I think we've worked into this a uh a pretty substantial uh number of strands in the bundles it's going to run uh, on the backbone uh, so i think we have uh, plenty of room for expansion thank you yeah, Bill, that, that, any further questions? That, Mary, if you don't mind, I just wanted to jump in real quick. Um, that's one of the famous last words, right, Joe, is you know, we, <laughs> with technology unknowns, you, you never know with technology. But I will tell you that Steve, um, uh, Brian, and I, when we talked about this, we, we made every, we're making every effort to, to put in um, you know, an, an appropriate uh, and, and forward-looking solution so that we can minimize those impacts. I, actually, I, I do have one more question. Um, to the extent, and uh, and it's still a big if at this point, but to the extent that we proceed with the public safety uh, building on Route 3A, uh, will that be tied in at all, or is that simply on the other network that was previously mentioned with respect to police and fire? Uh, that will be tied into our network, uh, plus I would expect that the Shrek would also uh, run fiber down there if they don't already have it uh, to include that station as well. Uh, so it would actually be on two different networks and, and that's the way it is today. Uh, there's fiber from uh, the Comcast iNet for us uh, going to Central Fire right now. And there's also fiber from the Shrek uh, private fiber going to their station as well. So if we proceed with the new building, would, will we need to amend the contract with contract um, to handle the additional building? Uh, during the build out of the public safety station, they would just need to work that into the construction cost just to tie it in between the station and the pole that, that's outside the building. Uh, because that, that backbone fiber is gonna run right by that location. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Bill, any other questions? Nothing further, thank you. Okay. Um, Steve, uh, apologize if, if maybe you mentioned this, but uh, when will this project commence and how long will it take to finish it? And will it bring better internet service for uh, Mary? Who's <laughs> <that problem> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is no. <laughs> I think uh, Brian, Brian may be able to uh, enlighten us on as far as, uh, you know, gathering inventory for the installation and approximate installation time. Yeah, Steve, I can address that. The, the current situation in the telecommunications world with COVID-19 impact on the manufacturing in the U.S., which most of the fiber is manufactured in North Carolina, the lead times on the materials are running between 12 and 15 weeks right now. Okay. I would anticipate this project realistically starting toward the end of February or thereabouts. 
and continuing into roughly June of next year. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Mary, if, if I can follow up, I thought there's a provision in the contract that has an end date by which the work has to be completed. Uh, that's correct. On the, on, as far as the Comcast contract, uh, they're expecting us to be over to our private fiber by August of 21. So that would give us a couple of months cushion. Okay. Terrific. Um, at this point, uh, I would open it up to uh, questions from the public. If uh, anyone wishes to ask a question or make a comment about this agenda item, uh, please use the raise hand function or uh, you will be given an opportunity if you choose to unmute your phone and ask a question. Okay, uh, seeing none, I would accept a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion to sign the agreement with um, Corporation for the Fiber Optic Municipal Area Network Project. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Uh, Steve and um, Mr. Hopkins, thank you both very much for, um, for being on the call tonight, for answering the questions, and um, we, uh, we hope those lead times will allow this to move forward. Um, obviously, one of our considerations when looking at this project, uh, Steve, was to take advantage of, of your time as much as we can, understanding that um, uh, that you will be retiring uh, shortly. So uh, again, appreciate all the effort to uh, bring this along and um, thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, um, the next possible vote that we have is to sign a letter thanking the Department of Environmental Protection for their support in the, in the water system acquisition. Uh, Tom or Michelle, I know that uh, Bill and Joe and I have been provided with a draft letter in our packet, but for benefit of the audience, uh, perhaps one, one of you could please uh, just uh, de describe what this vote is about. Sure. So uh, MassDEP was, um, was a major player in the transition process um, of, of ownership from the private, uh, private aquarium to the town's ownership of the water system. And, uh, and this is, I, th I think, an, an appropriate and um, timely uh, acknowledgement of the support of MassDEP as an organization and specifically that of Commissioner Suberg. Okay, and I, I would just add, uh, you know, Bill and Joe, um, right after the town meeting vote, um, the town and Aquarian met with DEP to talk about the business plan requirements, the good husbandry, um, you know, EP, environmental partners group uh, worked with the DEP on the business plan. You may recall that we submitted our business plan to the DEP, I think it was around May 1st, and you know, right, right in the middle of COVID, and within two weeks, we actually got confirmation by email that our business plan met the requirements and we received a formal letter from the DEP in June, uh, actually on June 1st. Under ordinary circumstances, that timing was, was really significant, but when you think about COVID and people working remotely, uh, we were so grateful to the partnership of the DEP in you know, doing, it, doing its necessary due diligence and review to ensure that we could meet a, a July 31st transition date. So um, I agree with Tom. I think this letter is uh, both appropriate and timely. And uh, I don't know if either of you have any questions for Tom about this letter. I, I've re reviewed the letter and I think it um, appropriately um, thanks uh, state officials for their work. Uh, and Mary, I, I know how quickly um, we did get a response from SDEP. Uh, I, I have one change to the letter um, that I would like to make, but other than that, I think this is great. 
Um, okay. W would you like to offer that right now before I, sure. I ask sure. Bill for comments? Yeah. So uh, I don't know who's got if uh, Tom or Michelle who has the letter. Yep. The, the very last sentence of the last paragraph that says, through this correspondence, the Board of Selectmen wishes to formally thank Commissioner. You see that? Yep. It should say wishes formally to thank rather than to formally. <laughs> you have improperly split an infinitive there. <laughs> so it should that's say what wishes. a split infinitive is. <laughs> that's what it is. So it should say wishes formally to thank uh, or to thank formally, however you'd like to do it. Um, other than that, it's a superb letter. Thank you. Okay, Bill? Uh, nothing to add. Um, just ready to sign it. Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments from the public on this letter? Okay, uh, seeing none, I'd, I'd accept a motion uh, to sign the letter as amended. I would move uh, to authorize uh, the board uh, since it looks like it's going to be signed by each one of us, uh, to sign the letter thanking the Department of Environmental Protection for support in the water system acquisition. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Thank you. Uh, the next possible vote that we have, and I believe we have our harbor master on the line, is a vote to allow the town clerk and the harbor master to issue shellfish permits from September 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Um, I, I see we have harbor master Ken Corson. Um, Ken, if you could perhaps provide an overview on this, uh, on this vote. Sure, so one of my other duties other than harbor master is to manage the town's shellfish resource in the capacity of um, the shellfish officer. So the shellfish, we, we have commercial shellfishing where diggers go out into the mudflats, they collect clams and they go up to Newburyport for um, depuration. We haven't shellfished since 2016 and prior to 2016, we hadn't shellfished um, since 2011. Um, we've had a disease in the harbor that has kind of diminished, caused our shellfish population to diminish. So the shellfish diggers have not been here. They'd like to come back for a couple of months for a couple of reasons. One, they'd like to see how our resource is doing and harvest some shell shellfish if they can, and they're gonna have some shutdowns in other communities. So currently, if they were to come back, they would have to pay up for an entire year, a full year, and they're only looking to dig three months. You'll see that I requested four months just in case they have some weather closures due to rain. So they'd like to dig for three months, and I'm asking the board if we can prorate that fee so that they can pay for three months. If they have some closures, they'll be here into December, but they plan to be done um, by November. Okay. Uh, Joe or Bill, any questions for Ken? Uh, Ken, would their activity have any disruption on uh, other activity in, in Hingham Harbor? Not really. Um, when they've dug in the past, we really don't have any issues with other activities. Uh, sometimes we've had issues with, you know, complaints about holes in the in the mud that they might leave. But there's really no conflict with any other activities. And, and if there were to be some sort of shoreside activity, we can try to plan ahead and make sure that they won't be in that, that location. Uh, and what sort of enforcement activity uh, is involved? So, for example, if Digger, do diggers show up without requesting permission and do you have to uh, address that, that situation? That could happen. I don't think we would see that taking place this year. Um, we will monitor them closely when they're out there. We'll make sure that they have their permit or that they've been issued a permit. Uh, at the end of the, the day when they're done digging, we go out and we inspect their catch, make sure that they, the shellfish are of all proper size and um, we then make sure that they go up to Newburyport for depuration. And uh, what are the prerequisites to qualify for getting a permit? Just paying the money or is it more than that? It's, it's really just paying the money. Um, there might be a couple other things that they have to do. They, well, they have, I guess there are some other things. They have to be under a master digger. So a master digger has to be involved because the okay. master digger will bring the, the material, the shellfish up to Newburyport. So there's a couple small prerequisites, but there's nothing substantial. 
um, that anyone really needs to meet. They have to have that, they have to have a state permit and so forth and, and the ability to then um, get the town's, the town's shellfish license. Do you have a projection for how many diggers we're talking about? Is it, I just don't have a sense. Is it like five or 50 or what are That's we a great at? question. I think we're looking at under 10. Okay. I have no other questions then, thank you. Bill? Yeah, out of curiosity, what was the, what was the disease in the harbor that prevented the, um, the harvesting of the selfish fish? Um, that's a great question. And I just, it's neoplasia is the name of the disease, neoplasia. And who and determines, what, go, sorry, go ahead. The, the neoplasia, what it caused to happen is caused the shellfish to die off pretty young. They never really developed to um, a harvestable size, so they would they would spawn, breed, and then they would start to grow, and then they would just die off. And I guess neoplasia is some form of like a cancer within within shellfish, but it, it's not something that humans have to worry about. It's not not something that we'll get sick with. Um, it's been throughout Boston Harbor, not just in Hingham, and um, it's been studied by the state very closely. Um, we managing our shellfish resource. We work closely with the state. They make sure that the shellfish population is safe and they monitor the water quality and, and stuff like that. And then we do the local enforcement um, to make sure that the diggers out there are digging in the right spot and that they're only digging when they're supposed to. Oh, great, nothing else, thank you. Okay, uh, is there uh, uh, any questions or comments from the public on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'd accept a motion. I'm happy to make it. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Pull it up here. I'd make a motion uh, to allow the town clerk and Harbor Master to issue shellfish permits from September 1, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Second. Any further discussion? Oh, one, one second. Eric, do, do, yes. do we need in, in our motion to reference the uh, the Fee, the license fees as proposed by the harbor master? Uh, I, would, I would defer to Tom on that. It can't hurt. It can't hurt. I'll say, so Bill, if, if I could amend your motion to allow the town clerk and harbor master to issue selfish permits from September 1, 2020 through December 31, 2020, consistent with the license fees as presented by the harbor master in his memo date of August 27, a second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Ken, thank you very much. Yes, Ken, thank you. Um, You're very welcome. Next item of business on our agenda is the uh, COVID-19 update. Tom, Michelle? Sure. Can you, I'm going to jump over to it. <clears throat> So uh, as of today, uh, September 1st, 2020, uh, Massachusetts remains in phase three, step one at this time. Public health indicators in Massachusetts continue to hold steady. Um, the Department of Public Health is reporting 118,784 confirmed cases in Massachusetts, of which 9,097 are in Plymouth County. As of last Wednesday, the DPH was reporting 296 COVID-19 cases in Hingham, keeping us in the green or the lower risk category. Uh, a couple of travel order updates. The Commonwealth continues to update the list of lower risk states associated with the COVID-19 travel order that went into effect earlier this month. As of today, travelers from from the following lower risk states are not required to fill out the Massachusetts travel form and do not need to quarantine. Those states include Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and West Virginia. States included on the list uh, based on meeting, are based on meeting two criteria. One, average daily cases per 100,000 below six, and two, positive t uh, test rate below 5%, both measured as a seven-day rolling average. Uh, Massachusetts residents are urged to limit any out-of-state travel only to states designated as COVID-19 lower state risks. 
uh, excuse me, lo lower risk states. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, Michelle, well, anything well. to add? Not this week. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Uh, Joe or Bill, questions for Tom on the COVID-19 update? None for me. Okay. Um, any uh, questions from the public on the COVID-19 update? Um, Sean Galvin here. Um, I am wondering um, when the uh, Town Hall Senior Center DPW offices will reopen to the public and the public library reopen to the public for in-person browsing, computer usage, et cetera. Thank you. And Sean, before Mr. Mayo answers your question, just for the record, could you please give your address? Okay, I'm at 143 Fort Hill Street. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, can you answer Mr. Galvin's questions? Of course. Uh, thank you, Sean, for the question. Uh, we have received your emails, and, uh, and I appreciate your, your continuing uh, interest in, in our, our, our process um, and your patience, um, which has been considerable, because I know that this is a, a concern for you. Um, the, the town's stance and, and my the, the way that I'm rolling out our reopening plan with regards to municipal services, Sean, has, um, has everything to do with our ability to provide services to the, com to the community while balancing that, that those services against the risk to, um, to the general public and our employees uh, along the way. Um, as you point out, uh, often the, uh, a lot of towns are starting to reopen um, a bit more. Um, a lot of them are not. Uh, and they are continuing to to follow uh, similar guidelines to what we're doing. Um, I, I understand that the uh, well, I know that the library is providing specifically is providing um, curbside pickup, pre-order and curbside pickup of any material uh, that does not, I understand, uh, address your concern of of in-person browsing uh, and use of the computers in the in the facility. Unfortunately, Sean, right now, I would say that that is still too high a risk. And, uh, and I would, um, I'll, I think we're going to continue with the process as it's, um, as it's laid out right now for the foreseeable future. Tom, could you maybe for, for the benefit of, of Mr. Galvin's question and for the public, um, just describe the kind of, you know, the team that looks and considers and discusses these very questions because I know, you know, you and your team are meeting several times a week reviewing data, but, you know, perhaps just to give the community a little bit of a sense of who's involved in those decisions and factors that are considered uh, when making them. Yeah, thank you, Mary. That's uh, for prompting me. I should have gone there. Um, you're absolutely right. We meet, um, twice a week right now with the command group of the COVID-19 response team. And that includes myself, uh, Michelle Montsevier, the assistant town administrator, um, Steve Murphy, our fire chief, uh, now Dave Jones, our interim police chief, and of course, Susan Sarney, our public health director. Um, I think that it's important to know that while that group meets um, twice weekly, we are regularly reviewing um, state guidance state rules as they're being rolled out, um, new news, new outbreak news, new good news as that, as that um, comes out as well. When, when towns and surrounding areas are, are, doing, are doing well, we, we take that into consideration. We review and understand the, um, the, process, the procedures being followed by a lot of our regional towns as well. Um, so, you know, we're, we're weighing a lot. We're, we're also taking into account uh, comments and concerns of our, uh, of our staff. And of course, um, most importantly, as always, uh, the health and safety of the general public and, uh, and what re reopening in a, in a broader fashion might mean there. Okay. Um, Sean, does that, does that answer your question? Um, yes, it certainly does. And as I mentioned in the email, there were 45 other towns that public in person browsing in July and August. Um, so, and co and all tend to be slower than others. 
Yes, yes. Well, I um, uh, I think uh, all of the communities are trying to be measured, thoughtful, and deliberate in taking steps, always with with public health in mind. And um, I think we are, uh, you know, following the data, and we have. Uh, as, as Tom has mentioned, a group of people that are consistently and frequently uh, looking at all that data and monitoring and um, the fact that Hingham uh, only has 296 cases is a good thing, but, but obviously we want to keep that case count low. And so anytime we start opening up buildings, um, that certainly is, is foremost foremost in our minds. And Mary, if you don't mind, I'd like to just add to that. Um, you know, another important statistic and one that I don't often um, report out, but is that, and, and, I'm, and I'm risking bad luck here, I'm gonna, as I say it, I'm gonna knock on my wooden windowsill, not my Formica desk, uh, but we have not had any confirmed um, uh, positive cases um, with any employees in the town of Hingham today. And uh, that's something that is near and dear to my heart. It matters a lot to me. Our employees are what allows us to, um, to serve the public uh, as successfully as we do. Um, and not to mention the fact that all of these folks have families and lives uh, that we want them going home to at night um, successfully. So anyway, Thank you. Uh, I throw that out there. Yep. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next item on our, our agenda this evening um, are appointments, and I believe that we have some additional reappointments to make this evening. Um, Joe, I, uh, I guess maybe I will, I will lead off, and then I would invite my colleagues to, to join in. Uh, I would like to make a motion to reappoint Diane Morrison to the Beautification Commission for a three-year term ending June 30th, 2023. I second that. Any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. And I believe there is still one opening on the Beautification Commission. Uh, would someone else like to offer a motion? Sure, I, I would move to reappoint Tricia Burns and Patty Coyle to the Cultural Council for a three-year term ending June 30, 2023. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Aye. Bill? Aye. Aye. Mary? Aye. And I believe even with those reappointments, I believe we have, uh, I believe it's two vacancies on the Cultural Council, although the Council at in its current formation does meet the statutory five member requirement. Uh, uh, and, uh, Bill, would you like to offer a motion? I'd make a motion to reappoint Brian Tomasello and Kevin O'Brien to the Development and Industrial Committee for a five year term ending June 30th, 2025. I second that, and I also note that 2025 seems so far in the future. It's just amazing. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is one of the few committees with a, a five-year term, and we are so grateful for uh, citizens who are, you know, th this, is, this is a 10-year commitment for Mr. Tomasello and Mr. O'Brien. Um, any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Um, I would like to make a motion to reappoint Jennifer Murphy and Linda Hill to the Foster School Building Committee for a three-year term ending June 30, 2023, with a promise that the next three years will be busier than the first three. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Uh, I'd like to uh, make a motion to reappoint Carol Piles as the at-large member to the Historic Districts Commission for a three-year term ending June 30, 2023. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Aye. Bill? Aye. Aye. Mary? Aye. I make a motion to reappoint Tracy Shriver as the alternate architect to the Historic District Commission for a three-year term ending June 30th, 2023. Second. 
Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to reappoint Greg Doble to the Lincoln Apartment Board of Managers for a three-year term ending June 30th, 2023. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. And I think we have one more. Yes, I move to appoint Benjamin Burnham and Sevi Strevolowski to the Preservation Award Evaluation Committee for a three-year term ending June 30, 2023. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Okay. Uh, that concludes appointments for this evening. Uh, people who are familiar with our process will know that the board's appointments typically take place over a number of meetings. Uh, so we expect that uh, we will uh, have additional appointments to make on our next scheduled meeting, which will be on Tuesday, September 15th. Um, next item of business on the agenda is public comment. Um, just like to read a statement, the Board of Selectmen encourages community engagement and welcomes questions and comments as agenda items are discussed in the meeting. In addition, we have set aside up to 15 minutes right now for public comment on items that fall under the purview of the Board of Selectmen and are not already on tonight's agenda. If any guests wish to speak, please seek to be recognized. Once recognized, state your name and address and address your comments to the chair. Comments will be limited to three minutes per speaker and must relate to topics within the scope of responsibility of the Board of Selectmen. Speakers are encouraged to present their marks in a respectful manner and not to indulge in personalities. The public comment period is not a time for debate by the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Selectmen is not adopting or endorsing any of the comments made during this public comment period. Is there anyone who would like to make a public comment on any item not on tonight's agenda? Okay, uh, seeing none, the next item of business is Selectmen and Town Administrator Reports. Michelle? Nothing from me, Mary, thank you. Tom? I don't want to steal you up here. Are you going to speak to our meeting, our, our uh, event the other morning, Mary? No, I think you should. Okay, so the town was um, fortunate to receive the first uh, disbursement of funds from the CARES Act on Monday morning at 11 o'clock out in front of Town Hall um, and to the tune of some $60,000, which was the first um, the first application that the town made. And that, in, that included funding for uh, a lot of the, the initial purchase of um, the PPE inf uh, um, products that we needed. Um, we were joined uh, Monday morning by Congressman Stephen Lynch, uh, Senator uh, um, Pat O'Connor, and uh, um, Representative Joan Moschino, as well as um, a couple of the, the Plymouth County Commissioners and uh, the County Treasurer, uh, Tom O'Brien. Uh, so Mary and I uh, had the pleasure of being out there, hearing all of them say wonderful things about the town, and uh, that's always enjoyable. And, and we had the opportunity, I think, as I see it anyway, to, to thank them for all of their efforts um, and for their presence at that, at that uh, check presentation. So that was nice to that was a uh, nice to engage in, and the other comment I just wanted to let the public and the board uh, be aware that the Route 228 uh, road project is nearing completion. Their uh, national grid is expecting about two more weeks on that project. That's um, that's terrific. So that'll actually that it may be completed before before school starts. That's right. Which that's I right. think would be I think would just uh, be helpful. Yep. Um, yep. Thank you, Joe. Um, I have nothing other than uh, welcome back, Tom Mayo, from uh, a well-deserved <laughs> vacation. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Bill. Yeah, I have one thing real quick. Um, last week, uh, Tony Marcion uh, retired. Tony um, was the owner and um, 
the, the one you know one of several barbers over the years at the Station Twenty Nine Barbershop um, down by the Sub Galley. Um, you know, Tony um, cut three generations of my family's hair, my father's hair, my hair, my brothers, and now my children's hair. And uh, he worked there for about fifty-five years. And you know, I know that there's a lot of there's a nice tribute on social media to Tony, and. Um, uh, he will be so missed. I mean, he's in his 80s now, and what a wonderful member of our community and uh, the thousands of people who he interacted with over the years. And I just wanted to give him a congratulations and, and just say, you know, I've never met anyone with, with a stronger work ethic. Um, even in his 80s, he was coming to work um, in snow and ice and, and working all day, staying on his feet. So I just want to point out, you know, a wonderful a wonderful member of our community um, has retired and just a great guy. Uh, thank you. Well, well said. Um, I had a, a couple of things just to build on uh, what Tom mentioned about the CARES Act. I just want to acknowledge the efforts of our town accountant, Sue Nickerson, in doing all of the administrative work, which is substantial in getting the reimbursements for the CARES Act. Um, Plymouth County takes their responsibility for administering $91 million very seriously. And, you know, the first time you submit something for reimbursement, you kind of figure out what level of details needed, what has to come in. And, um, you know, Sue, just like everything else she does, um, she handled it with professionalism, with patience. Uh, she just stuck with it. And I would also add that while people were there, um, both Tom and I were, you know, chatting with people and, and talking, but letting them know that we actually will be submitting a, uh, our next reimbursement request, I think is in excess of $700,000. Um, and that is going to be for, uh, in particular, a lot of technology and items for the schools. Uh, we also talked with Congressman Lynch and with uh, State Senator O'Connor and Representative Moschino uh, about the fact that, um, you know, while certainly the CARES Act is helpful and welcome, um, it's, it's not going to be enough to cover potentially all of the COVID costs that communities like Hingham are facing. And, um, you know, we, we both thank them for their efforts to secure additional funding um, but, but also, you know, talked about how important that was uh, to, to all of them. Um, today, is, uh, today is election day. I think the polls closed a short time ago. And, you know, many, many thanks to our town clerk, Eileen McCracken, and her team, and all of the volunteers who worked on early voting, um, mail-in voting, voting today at the polls, um, you know, one of the great things is that we now all have many, many different voting options, and that is a considerable amount of work for our town clerk and her team. And um, uh, again, you know, Eileen and her team just do such a great job, and so we thank them. Uh, the last thing I would just mention is that um, Michelle and I last week um, attended the first forecast group meeting of the year. And, you know, people may recall that when we put together the FY21 financial management plan, we spoke about the forecast group meeting monthly to see how we're doing. And so we had, uh, we had July results, which is the first month of the fiscal year. And um, I think the headlines were that um, so far the revenue, uh, we, we don't get a good picture of revenue really until the quarter ends. But, but so far, it's all looking kind of in line with our expectations. We're not, we're not seeing anything that gives us any cause for concern. I think the significant thing that we saw is that our expenses, when compared to previous years, were lower. And what, what we think that means is that the Tier 1 cost reduction measures that the town is taking and the school department is taking are working. Um, in particular, the rate at which we are uh, spending our capital dollars is um, at a slower velocity than, than as of last year. 
And, you know, I would just, um, you know, acknowledge the efforts of, of Tom, Michelle, Dr. Austin, John Ferris for just leading the way. And, and thanks to all the department heads and building principals for, um, you know, participating in this. What it means is that if, if we have some COVID expenses that we have to absorb, um, th this will give us a little bit of a, of a cushion to fall back on. And um, it's clear to me participating in that, that um, all of our employees are, are being very conscious of the economic situation. And, you know, we're very grateful for that. We will probably have a better line of sight, you know, in September when we have two months of data. But I think the real thing will be probably in October after we've closed the quarter to see how property tax collection rates are going. Um, I, I would just add that, you know, looking at a lot of the, a lot of the information that we get and we get it through our rating agencies and other places, um, you know, the, the projection is that, is that we will all be feeling the financial impact of COVID, not just in FY21, but in FY22. So as, as we continue to kind of work through this, um, we are being advised to take a multi-year view and um, and I think that's what we had in mind when we when we put the get together the plan in May. So that's just uh, kind of an update on town finances. Uh, I I believe that concludes our business for this evening. Um, the board, as I mentioned, uh, our next scheduled meeting will be on Tuesday, September fifteenth. So uh, I would accept a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. adjourn. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Aye. Mary? Aye.